Welcome to My Dreams Academy. Those can be presented in two structures, either in the linear structure, otherwise known as the Fisher's model, or the ring structure. And the ring structure can be in two ways, but glucose is just one of them. In ring structure, you can have the pyranus, and you can have the furanus. So, pyranus is a six membered ring. Six members. And furanus is a five membered ring, so it has five members. But glucose is a pyranus or a pyranus because it has a six membered ring. And the ring goes this way. You have your this, you have this, and this, and like this, like this, and like this. Then you have your CH2OH. Then you put your HOH. So this here is the is the ring structure of glucose and it has a six member ring. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. But this is not the way the carbon is counted. If you do the counting, you start from here. This is carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six. So this is the pyranose, and it is the ring representation of glucose. What we did here is the linear representation. So taking it all over again, glucose can be represented by two structures, which is the linear structure or the Fisher's model, and we have the ring structure that depicts glucose as a six-membered ring known as a pyranose. And when you do the counting, you do it clockwise so you come from here come like this this is carbon one carbon two carbon three carbon four carbon five and carbon six so it's a clockwise counting and it's called pyranus which represents is so using glucose as a model we can now develop the structure of other aldohexoses which are sugars which are monosaccharides with six carbon atoms and an aldose functional group. So glucose is the model. From glucose, you can develop mannose. We can also develop galactose. Let's take mannose first. So mannose is also a hexose. So it's a hexose in that it has six carbon atoms and it's an aldose. So it has an aldose functional group. But there is a problem because mannose is not the same thing with glucose around all the carbons. So if you say that this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, mannose differs from glucose around carbon 2. But apart from this carbon, mannose and glucose are alike in every other carbon. So we have around here, it's also a reversal. So we have instead of having H this side and instead of having OH here and H here what we do is the reverse we have H here and H here so this is the only difference that exists between glucose and mannose so from here at carbon 3 so here we have the same configuration around carbon 3 we have our H and OH well, we have our H and OH, carbon 5 we have the same, and carbon 6 we have the same configuration. So the observation here is that glucose and mannose are similar in their configuration around every other carbon atom except around carbon when they are mirror images of one another as carbon 2. So this phenomenon is called epimerism. And by definition, epimerism is a type of isomerism that exists in monosaccharides. And in this type of isomerism, there is a difference in configuration in only one carbon atom apart from the number one carbon atom for aldosis 
So take it all over again. Apimerism is a type of isomerism that occurs in monosaccharides where there is a difference in configuration at any carbon atom apart from the anomeric carbon. So when we have a difference in the anomeric carbon, we call it anomerism. And for aldosis, anomerism is a phenomenon that occurs only in carbon 1, but apimerism occurs in every other carbon. That means from carbon 2 to carbon 6, we can have apimerism, but when you have a difference in configuration at carbon 1, it is called anomerism. So it, it means that glucose and manose are apimers. So in other words, you can say that glucose is a second apimer of manus or vice versa. You can also say that manus is the second apimer of glucose and what this means is that glucose and manus are alike in every other aspect of their configuration except at carbon 2. Now, using glucose as model again, we can also develop the structure of galactose and galactose is alike Galactose and glucose are alike except at carbon 4. So the rule is that you take the carbon skeleton You take the carbon skeleton having in mind that galactose is also a hexose just like glucose. We have one, two, three, four five and six and it's also an aldose an aldo hexose so it means it also has the aldehyde functional group but it is a first apima of glucose not a second apima so it means that glucose and galactose are alike in all the carbons except at carbon four so at carbon two we take the same configuration as we have in glucose at carbon 3 we take the same configuration but at carbon 4 there is a reversal so the reversal in carbon 4 places an OH by the side by the right side and places a H by the left side but in carbon 5 we have the same configuration and in carbon 6 we also have the same configuration so by and large the only difference that exists between galactose and glucose is in carbon number four where they have a reversal a lateral inversion of their configurations but if you look at this glucose being at the center is an epima of manus and also an apimer of galactose now the question is are uh, galactose and manose apimers the answer is no they are not apimers because apimerism implies a difference at only one carbon atom but if you look at galactose the carbon 2 of galactose is not the same as the carbon 2 of manose and the carbon 4 of galactose is also not the same as the carbon 4 of manose so because they are di they are different in more than one carbon atom they are not apimers rather they are diastereoisomers So the relationship that exists between galactose and manose is diastereoisomerism. But when it comes to glucose, glucose is an apima of manose. Glucose is also an apima of galactose. But galactose and manose are diastereoisomers. Now, taking anomerism in detail, remember we just dealt with apimerism and we considered it as a change in configuration at from carbon two to carbon 6 but now we are going to take anomerism in which there is a difference just a carbon 1 so for anomerism we have just two types of any aldo sugar and that is the alpha type and the beta type so when you have when you have the oxygen at the left hand side it is called an alpha configuration so this configuration of glucose is the alpha configuration because it has the O at 
the left hand side and has the page at the right hand side so this is called the alpha configuration so this is alpha glucose but in another configuration whereby you have your reversal where you have your at carbon one you have your o here and your h here this is called the beta configuration so this is called anomerism. There is a difference in configuration at carbon one, and it has to do with the orientation of the of the functional group around carbon. So when you have it this side, it is called the alpha, and when you have it here, it is called the beta. So this phenomenon is called anomerism, where there is a difference at the carbon that gives the functional group, which is the anomeric carbon. Now we have to look at another type of isomerism that exists in in, in hexosis and this is the configuration that exists at the carbon at the chiral carbon that is farthest from the functional group or from the anomeric carbon so I mentioned the word chiral and chiral carbon means a carbon that is surrounded by four different functional groups so chiral carbon it has a carbon at the center and it has a different functional group around around the carbon so let's take w x y and z as four different functional groups so when you have a carbon that is surrounded by four different functional groups in which neither of them is the same as the other we have w as a different functional group have x as different y as different and z as different this type of carbon is called a chiral carbon so when you come to the structure of hexosis you can find so many chiral carbons Taking this as an example, this is not a chiral carbon. Carbon 1 is not a chiral carbon because it is not surrounded by four functional groups. It is surrounded by just three functional groups. For it to be a chiral carbon, the number one qualification is that you must have, you must be surrounded by four groups. And the four groups have to be different. So what disqualifies carbon 1 as a chiral carbon is that it is surrounded by just three groups so starting from carbon 2 carbon 2 is a chiral carbon because it is surrounded by four different groups so this is the first group this is the second group this is the third group and this is the fourth this is the fourth group so this is a chiral carbon because it is surrounded by four different functional groups it has the OH group here it has the H group here and it has this very large group here and it also has this here and none of these four groups are the same so that is why it is said to be a chiral carbon in the same vein this is also a chiral carbon this is a chiral carbon this is also a chiral carbon but this is not a chiral carbon because it has hydrogen here and also another hydrogen here so by virtue of two of the groups attached to the carbon being the same this has disqualified carbon 6 from being a chiral carbon so the chiral carbons we have in a molecule of glucose is carbon 2 carbon 3 carbon 4 and carbon 5 so what i want to introduce is the anode the type of isomerism that buttresses on the configuration as the chiral carbon that is farthest from the anomeric carbon granted the anomeric carbon is at carbon one and the chiral carbon that is farthest away from the anomeric carbon here is carbon five so there is a type of isomerism that is based on the configuration around the chiral carbon that is farthest from the anomeric carbon and that is what gives you a d glucose capital letter d and an l glucose so a D glucose is the one that has the OH group at the left hand side around the carbon that is farthest from the functional group. So granted this is the carbon 5 and it is the penultimate carbon. So for glucose, whether it is a D glucose or L glucose has to do with the configuration around carbon 5. So when you have the OH group by the left hand side, it is called a D glucose. And when you have the OH group at the other side so if this be another configuration where you have your H here and your OH here and this is carbon 5 so this 
is what the L configuration will look like. But in nature, we have D glucose. L glucose does not occur in nature. So this type of isomerism has to do with carbon 5 or the penultimate carbon which is the carbon that is farthest away from the anomeric carbon and this is what gives rise to what we know as the d glucose but not the L type of isomerism that exists in monosaccharides is what you call the optical isomerism This type of isomerism does not have to do with differences in empirical formula. It also doesn't have to do with differences in molecular formula. It doesn't have to do with differences in structural formula. It only has to do with the differences on the rotation of plane polarized light, which means that one variant rotates plane polarized light to the right, and the other variant rotates plane polarized light to the left so just like i said initially that the difference in optical isomerism is not based on empirical formula they are the same empirically it is also not based on the molecular formula so when you come to molecular formula optical isomers are the same it's also not based on the structural formula so we have this what it is based on is on it based on the way or the direction they rotate plain polarized light and they are mirror images of one another. So optical isomerism is the type of isomerism that exists between two different variants of a compound whereby one rotates plain polarized light to the right and the other rotates it to the left. So the, 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 the compound that rotates to the right is called dextro-rotation. And the one that rotates to the left is called level rotation. So in short hand, the dextro-rotatory are represented as a small letter D or a positive sign. This should not be confused with the D glucose and the L glucose, which we treated earlier. These ones have to do with the configuration around the chiral carbon that is farthest from the anomeric carbon, as we have already said. So when you see a small letter D or a positive sign, it should not be confused with this because it's talking about optical isomerism. So for level rotation, we have the L sign or the negative sign and that means that D glucose is dextro rotatory and L glucose means glucose that is level rotatory but this is the natural form of glucose D dextro rotatory glucose is also the same as D glucose but in different aspects it means that D glucose is dextro rotatory but D fructose is level rotatory. So the idea is this the capital letter D has to do with the configuration at the penultimate carbon atom, while the small letter D has to do with the direction to which the compound rotates plane polarized light. So it means that a D configuration can either be dextro rotatory or level rotatory, and they should not be confused to be the same. So we also have a fructose. The fructose is level rotatory. What it means is that fructose rotates plain polarized light to the left. So when two compounds are optical isomers, they are called enantiomers. Enantiomers are optical isomers. It means that they are the same in every other aspect, apart from the fact that they rotate plain polarized light to different directions. So, when you have an enantioma, what qualifies it to do the rotation is a chiral carbon. All enantiomas must have at least one chiral carbon. So, the possession of a chiral carbon is what qualifies a compound to be able to rotate plane polarized light. But there is what you call internal compensation and external compensation.
is because in as much as in as much as the basic qualification to be an optical isomer or the basic qualification to exhibit optical isomerism is the possession of a chiral carbon some compounds possess more than one chiral carbon but yet they have no optical isomerism the explanation is this if a compound has a chiral carbon one and a chiral carbon two the chiral carbon one may be dextro rotatory and the chiral carbon two may be level rotatory we are talking about the same compound that has two different chiral carbons but one rotates plane polarized light to the right and the other rotates plane polarized light to the left in as much as they are the same compound but they have two different chiral carbons whereas one does the opposite of what the other does there is no optical isomerism because of internal compensation because the compound has a chiral carbon that acts to the right and also has one that acts to the left so there will be a neutralization or a reversal of what the chiral carbons are doing so when this one rotates to the right the other one rotates to the left and there will be no optical isomerism because of internal compensation there is also what is known as external compensation this comes into play when a compound which is dextro rotatory is mixed with another compound which is level rotatory now we are talking about two different compounds remember in internal compensation it is one compound that has two chiral carbons that rotate plane polarized lights to different directions now in external compensation we are talking about a mixture that has equal modes of a dextro rotatory compound and a level rotatory compound so it means we have one more of a D compound and another one more of an L compound now when these two compounds are mixed together there will be no optical isomerism and the explanation is external compensation whereby the one mole of a D compound rotates plane polarized light to the right and the one mole of an L compound rotates plane polarized light to the left so there is an external compensation whereby compound A reverts what compound B does so in the, in the, in the long run there will be no optical isomerism in as much as the first compound has a chiral carbon and the second has a chiral carbon but because they rotate at different directions there will be a net neutralization such that we have what we call external compensation so we are coming to the end of today's tutorial and in conclusion we are going to do a little recap of what we have treated from the beginning of the lecture till now and we define carbohydrates we define it as a polyhydroxic aldehyde or a polyhydroxy ketone which is optically active or compounds that are derived from dihydrolysis we also mentioned some of the functions of carbohydrates which includes there being a source of immediate energy and as energy stores we also emphasize their relevance in cell signaling and in the industries where cellulose as an example is used as the raw material for cell tape we also talked about the classification of carbohydrates based on the number of sugar subunits into monosaccharides disaccharides oligosaccharides and yeah. okay then we went ahead to classify monosaccharides based on their functional groups we classify them into ketosis and aldosis we also classify them based on the number of carbon atoms into triosis tetrosis pentosis and hexosis and i went ahead to talk about isomerism as it occurs in monosaccharides we talked about the apimerism we talked about the anomerism we talked about optical isomerism so this should be the end of today's tutorial so in the next session we are going to look at the various reactions and the test for carbohydrates and we'll also look at the clinical relevance so remember to subscribe to our channel to get our videos subsequently and click on the notification icon thank you for your time